Hey everyone, Jake here from CVP. Today, we are looking at Sony's newest addition to their cinema line, and it's a bit of a unique one. This is the ILME FR7. It's essentially an FX6 combined with the skeleton of a PTZ system. We all know and love the FX6 already, so in this video, we'll be focusing on this new system's benefits over the FX6, why you may want to use one in your next production, and give you a more general overview of PTZ systems. For those of you that aren't familiar, a PTZ camera is a motorized system that can pan, tilt, and zoom within its housing, hence the PTZ name. There are a range of companies that make PTZ systems. All the big camera companies like Sony, Canon, and Panasonic all have their own systems, but there are also other companies such as BirdDog, NewTek, and Data Video who specialize more in PTZ solutions. As with any piece of kit in our industry, they have their specific use cases where they are strong options to use. You will often see a PTZ camera being used in broadcast television studios, sporting and event productions, corporate spaces, live events such as music and house of worship, and much more. The key thing that using a PTZ offers is control. A few of these can be set up and then controlled remotely by one operator. For multi-camera productions where you have limited crew or space, PTZs can offer a much easier production experience. They can also be mounted inconspicuously, which can be great for reality or documentary filmmakers who can monitor the image remotely and control the camera systems without having to physically be in the room, which can change the way a person or animal behaves. This is also great for live events, as it means you can have a venue rigged up with these in subtle locations, and that way you can still capture video while not distracting the attendees. Another big feature of PTZ systems is their integration of video over IP. This could be a whole video in and of itself, so let us know in the comments below if you'd like a video of us looking at video over IP solutions. The biggest downside of PTZ systems is their image quality. They often use small sensors for two main reasons, size and zoom range. This does limit what kind of images can be captured and their low light performance. However, for most broadcast situations, the image quality from these systems will meet most production's needs. You will often be able to see the difference in image quality when cutting between a normal camera to a PTZ system but this has always been the compromise you'd have to make if you wanted to use a PTZ system. This is where Sony wants to position the FR7, FX6 image quality paired with the workflow of a PTZ camera. So now that we understand why people use PTZ cameras, what makes the FR7 so unique? The sensor size. As we said at the start of the video, the actual camera guts are basically identical to the FX6. This means it features the same recording formats and frame rates, video output options, menu system, and sensor and processing units. This means you get the same image quality with this system as you would with the FX6, and that is what makes this system unique in this space. Most PTZ cameras have smaller sensors to keep size down and also allow them to have much longer zoom range lenses in a compact package. However, this larger sensor should give the FR7 far better low light performance dynamic range and general image quality than the smaller sensor options. We won't be doing our normal deep dive into the image quality as we've already looked at the FX6 before, so if you want to check out those videos, you can via the links in the description below. However, we still did want to shoot something so we can show you some test footage as well as test the camera ourselves in a few mock real world scenarios. We unfortunately didn't have another PTZ camera to use alongside the FR7 to have a multi-camera setup. The FR7 has a pretty typical set of I.O. for a PTZ system. From left to right, you have the 19.5 volt DC power input for using the regular power supply. You then have the port for the single mode fiber output and a set of dip switches for controlling a few things. You then have a regular LAN port and then a time code in BNC. You have both a 12G SDI and HDMI for video output. This 12G SDI can also output Pro's RAW, just like the FX6 can. You will also be able to output video over IP via the LAN port using NDIHX. Next is a BNC for Genlock, a second LAN port, and then lastly, a five pin XLR audio import. This can provide phantom power and can be switched between line and mic level. Another unique feature this camera has over other PTZ options is its ability to record directly to either CF Express type A or UHS-2 SD cards. The camera features the same dual slot system as the FX6, and it features the same recording options as it as well, which means that media requirements are the same across both. You are able to output and record at the same time, which could be really helpful for productions requiring a mix of live production and recording for content after the initial production. When it comes to powering the system, you have two options. It uses the same DC 19.5 volt power supply that the FX6 uses. This means you will also be able to use the same DC power accessories. 
such as a regulated DC to DTAP cable, which will allow you to power the camera externally, or just off of mains or some kind of generator like an EcoFlow with the power supply. The other way to power it is to do so over Ethernet using PoE++. It is a thirsty camera, so you will need a powerful switch or router for this, or you can grab a PoE injector, which will be the most cost-effective solution. As it's effectively an FX6, your FR7 features the same excellent autofocus system as well. You can adjust the exact same autofocus parameters as the FX6, and this would be good for this type of system, where you may want to rely on its tracking of someone's face or general reliable autofocus. However, you will also be able to control the focus remotely with the correct lens. The FR7 is also rated as NC35 or less. NC stands for Noise Criterion, and it basically rates the amount of sound that is produced, and NC35 seems pretty low on the graph that I've seen. The system has two quarter inch threads on the bottom, and it is decently flat, so you can easily sit it on a counter or other flat surface. However, like most other PTZ systems, you can also ceiling mount it using the correct bracket. Just bear in mind that it is quite heavy at 4.7 kilograms. There are also tally lights on the side of the unit. Most normal PTZ systems have fixed lenses that offer a balance of speed and zoom range while also being compact inside the PTZ's body. There have been some interchangeable lens PTZ systems through the years, but this is the first from Sony. The FR7 uses Sony's E-mount and allows the user to change lenses. However, there are some limitations. So Sony has produced a database of lenses that are compatible with the FR7. But of course, this will be something that will evolve and improve as Sony brings out new lenses and make current E-mount options compatible via firmware. When putting a different lens on, you will need to adjust the balance of the camera. This is easily done using the lever at the back of the system and then sliding the carriage back and forth until you get the new lens balanced. There's a good amount of resistance to this and it feels smooth to do. There's a scale here, which is great for when you use different lenses. You can just note down what lens is which and then swap them really quickly. Sony have actually given us a few predetermined positions on the scale for a few different lenses, which you can see here. If you want to use larger, heavier lenses without using the PTZ function, you can lock off the pan and tilt and still use the camera as normal. This is done using this slider here. The system also has 15 mm bars and a lens support which is definitely worth using if you can to add extra rigidity to your configuration. Currently, this camera is definitely going to give you the best experience with Sony lenses that feature zoom servos, of which there are only a handful currently, with a lot of them only covering APS-C. The FR7 does have a Super 35 mode, but because of the camera's native 4K sensor, it does mean that you can only capture and output 1080p. However, you do get the extra reach, which could be good for some productions that don't need 4K. One workaround for this is to use clear image zoom. This allows you to digitally zoom in around by an extra 1.4 times in 4K or two times in Full HD, which could really help with coverage or let you get that little bit extra reach out of your lenses. You will lose a bit of quality because you are essentially upscaling a lower resolution up to 4K, but this could be handy for some productions that deem this loss in quality acceptable. You can still record and output 4K at the same time when using clear image zoom. The FR7 will be available with and without a kit lens, which is the 28-135mm powered zoom lens. The 28-135mm is now nearly 8 years old, and it's not the best lens optically, but it's a great size zoom given the features and coverage that it has. It is going to be one of the key lenses for the FR7 as it has the best zoom range currently for this system with full frame coverage but this is still quite a low 4.8 times zoom range. And when you compare that to the optical ranges you can normally expect out of a PTZ system of upwards of 10 times, this will be a step backwards for people familiar with these systems. However, the flip side to this is that you can choose exactly what lens you want depending on the scenario as you can with other interchangeable lens cameras. This means that you can get very different imagery out of this system than you can with a traditional PTZ. You just can't zoom as much or at all if you're using a prime. I do wonder if Sony are planning on integrating a system so this can be used with broadcast lenses that also have zoom and focus servos. Sony recently released their 16-35mm powered zoom lens and they have promised that more lenses with zoom servos built in will be coming soon. With the demo unit Sony sent us, they also sent an RM-IP500, which is one of their PTZ camera control units. You can either connect this directly to a single FR7 using the Visca 42 port on the back of the IP500 or via a router using the LAN port, the latter being how we did it most of the time while testing. You can connect multiple cameras to this at once using this method and easily switch between them. 
Once configured, which is actually surprisingly simple, you can control a bunch. The menu system is essentially broken into controlling the camera or the remote head. You can fully control the camera and its menu system from here, adjusting everything you may want to on the fly. You can also control all of the parameters of the remote head's functions, and of course, the movement of the camera. You have this joystick for panning and tilting, a zoom rocker and dials for focus and exposure. You can dial in the sensitivity of all of these depending on what you need for a given shot or composition. I'm not some PTZ specialist, so this is the first time I'd really gone in deep with this controller and set up this whole system. So downloading the manual on my phone when we couldn't figure out something was a must. One of those moments was programming the recall presets. Recall presets essentially allow you to set the camera at a given position, focus and zoom, and then recall it. This could be good for having presets for a given show, for given cameras. Take for example a cooking show. You could have a PTZ set up with three different presets for different parts of the kitchen, like a chopping board, oven and mixer for example. You would then be able to easily go between them by pressing just a button. However, you could also use it to do repeatable moves like any other camera robot. We did this for this continuous loop of Sam in our engineering department and it came out pretty well, apart from the shaky floor. This loop we made was six different positions with several different takes stitched together. Creating a preset is a bit of a process. You have to make sure direct recall is off, then go to your position. Then you have to go into the RM menu and decide how fast you want the recall to be. You then hit the number you want it to be stored on and then hold the store until the colors of it invert. You can now hit direct recall, hit the number you want and voila, you have a position recall set up. The only thing we didn't like controlling on this setup was the focus. When in manual focus mode, it feels quite hard to smoothly pull between different focus distances. However, using touch autofocus through the web browser is a really great experience. Sony also allows you to control the camera via web browser login. You can access this via LAN or wirelessly if you're using a wireless router. The camera does not have Wi-Fi built in. All you need to do is type in the IP address of the camera you want to connect to, type in the login details, and you're in. One issue I did run into though was not being able to log in here. If someone has reset the network settings, which you can do by using the dip switches on the back of the unit and the reset button, you will still be greeted with the login panel in your web browser, but you need to type in just admin and no password. You can then set the password and then you'll be able to log in and gain access to the control panel. Here you can control the full PTZ system as you can with the IP500. Of course, it isn't quite the same operating experience as using a physical controller, but it will be much more affordable and easier for people who aren't used to PTZ controllers. And I think it does have its benefits actually, and could be a great thing to use alongside a physical controller. This is a really well thought out control panel. Everything feels really snappy and fast to control, and the latency between the camera and the fly feed is pretty low actually. At the home screen, you get a nice big preview of your image, as well as a bunch of controls. Along the bottom, you have two rows of controls. The top bar is your basic camera settings, which you can just tap on and adjust. There's also two controls, one for toggling display setting overlays and one for enabling touch autofocus overlays. You can toggle touch autofocus via a smartphone or tablet using touch or using a mouse click when using a PC. The second is 10 different functions that you can define in the camera's menu under user buttons. These update really fast as well when you change them in the menu. Down the left, you can create presets, which can be recalled at any time. You can have up to 100 presets here, and they're very similar to the recall presets that we spoke about with the IP500. These are for your PTZ position, so you can set your position and zoom, and then just recall it. You can adjust the speed at which this is executed to from 1 all the way to 50. On the right, you have a bunch of different key control parameters. You can control the full camera menu here using the camera GUI tab, as well as the PTZ positioning using this virtual joystick. Along the top, you can toggle between a few different pages. You can play back here and can change a few settings that you may need to adjust. You can also lock the interface here, which could be handy if you don't want to accidentally change anything. You can also toggle a full screen mode via this button, or you can type in the IP address of your camera, slash livestream.html. This will give you a full screen image free from any controls, 
which could be handy if you need to give someone access to monitoring the image without control of the camera. When Sony told us that they were bringing out the PTZ system using the FX6 sensor, our minds did wonder how they were going to handle this. And the FR7 is a little different to what we thought it was going to be. One of the big benefits of a PTZ system is to have a fully enclosed camera system inside a housing, and currently there isn't one for the FR7. The housing makes these systems less obvious when installed, and some are even weatherproof, which can be great for longer term outside installations. Take National History Productions for example, which will definitely be looking at this system, but I think a weatherproofed enclosure will be really important for them. I'm sure someone will make one eventually for it, but this will most likely be limited to what lenses you can use with it. I'm also intrigued to see if Sony are going to offer this in different colours for different environments. Another huge feature of this camera is the interchangeable lens mount, and Sony are keen to see what lenses people use with this. However, with no power outputs on the camera itself, it does limit how easy it's going to be to use a more cinema oriented lens with full fizz systems attached. You will need to add an external power source, which will need mounting and cabling. Fingers crossed Sony released some more powered zoom lenses ASAP. So with all of this in mind, who exactly is this camera for? Well, while the robotic side of controlling the camera is great, key features that are going to define its user base are its integration into existing PTZ workflows. However, I do think that the fact that this is part of the cinema line will open it up to a new audience that may not have considered a PTZ solution before. The system doesn't have a concrete price yet, so do take this with a pinch of salt, but pricing is estimated to be around 11,000 euros or dollars, or roughly 9,300 pounds, but this can change. For up-to-date pricing, please head over to our website via the links in the description below. I don't think this will include any control units or any of the supplementary kit around it, so for a complete package, you will have the price pushed up a good bit. This is expensive for a PTZ system, and from a cinematic and budget perspective, using a gimbal like the RS3 or motion control head with an FX6 or other camera will probably be a smarter option for most. However, what you are really paying for here is the control of the PTZ system within the larger existing ecosystem of accessories that sit around it. And if you want the excellent image quality the FX6 can provide within a PTZ system and workflow, there really isn't anything else like the FR7 on the market. Whatever is best for you will depend on what you need, but I think it's at least cool to see Sony pushing their existing line. I just hope the fact that they've started making these means that FX6 stock is going to be better as soon as possible, as I know lots of you guys are still waiting for yours patiently. This is just our initial look and thoughts after a short time of this unit, so if you have any other questions please do let us know. Anyway, what do you think of the FR7? Let us know in the comments below. And if you like the video, please give it a like and maybe consider subscribing so you don't miss out on our awesome upcoming content. And thank you so much for watching.